now join me in Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. I'm going to read verses number 23 to 27. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. I'm going to read verses number 23 to 27. Hallelujah. If you're there, praise the Lord. If you brought your Bible to church this morning, praise the Lord. If that Bible was on your phone, praise the Lord. <laughs> you're welcome. God bless you. I was just checking that you're awake. All right. Good stuff. God bless you. Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart above all else. Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Hallelujah. I want to talk to us this morning about staying focused. Could you help me preach to you, someone sitting next to you this morning and just say to them, stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. If in the course of the sermon you notice they're getting distracted, you can nudge them. Not like my wife's type of nudging. When she nudges me, I have to massage the spot. Like, you know, the, the kind of, you know, just a slight one. Like, stay focused. Stay focused. Verse 25 there says, look straight ahead. If they're wandering around and they're looking like Rory is doing now, look, look straight ahead. <laughs> You're helping her to focus. <laughs> Oh, wow. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Can I submit to you this morning that evil is a distraction from righteousness? Just for context, I want to remind you that throughout this month, we've been talking about divine direction. And this, I'm speaking to you about staying focused on that, that, based on that foundation. That you understand that God has a purpose and a plan for you and for your life. That you understand that you're not ordinary. That you understand that no weapons formed or fashioned against you will ever prosper. That you understand that every tongue that rises up against you in judgment will be condemned for your sake. That you understand that you're a child of God. That you understand that God has a plan. And in his plan, it's all good for you. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of good and not of evil. To give you a hope. To give you a future. To give you what? An expected end. There is a purpose in God. And nothing can stop those plans from being fulfilled as long as we stay in the pathway that he has designed for us. I said to us that divine direction is based on the, based on the Bible. I'm talking about direction based on the Bible. It's the instructions of God. The word of God, whether Logos or Rhema, whether the written text or the, the revelationary word that God gives to you, maybe prophetic, maybe vision, maybe rev whatever form of revelation that God has given to you that is helping you to get to where God is taking you to. In the course of that journey, there will be lots of challenges. There will be lots of distractions. There will be lots of obstructions along the way. But the, 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 the key thing for you to take note of is that there is a guidance system in place for you. And God is guiding you. So he gives you a direction to go. You put, you, you know, I told you last Sunday, I said, you know, just like what Michael Jr. was saying, like there's a kind of a, you know, you can look at your relationship with God like a sat -nav navigation system. You put in a place, there's a specific place you're going, fair enough, but there are ways you have to, there are 
pathways you have to go through to be able to get there. There is direction for you, but there's also guidance for you. There's a way by which God nudges you and helps you to stay along the right paths for your life. Our scripture this morning says, look straight ahead. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. It says, look straight ahead. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. The reason it says, fix your eyes is because the eyes focuses through the lenses. And the lenses, you know, helps the, the old eye to focus. It takes in the light, it takes in the, the, the information and groups it together and, and allows you to be able to see by bringing all that into focus. There's going to be so many things on the horizon. There's going to be so many options along the way, the pathways of life. There's going to be so many things. And a lot of these things, these things if you look at, at them closely, they end up being distractions. Focus on what lies ahead of you. Focus on the pathway that God has designed for you. And then you're going to find peace. You're going to find fulfillment. You're going to find joy. You're going to find hope. Listen to me carefully. Our pathways in life are not the same. We might be going towards the same thing. We might end up in the same place. But the way God wants to take us there is not necessarily the same. We have different experiences and that's okay. We have different people coming to our life and go. And that's fine. Because what God is trying to do with each person can be different. It can be different. It, it can be very different. The pathways of my journey in life to become a pastor is, in my estimation, quite weird. But that's my estimation. You might say to somebody else, like, oh, that was obvious. That was not obvious to me. It was obvious to my wife, but it wasn't even obvious to me. I had other thoughts in my head. I had other things I thought I was going to do first. I had other distractions to attend to. Because you see, things that take you away from the pathways and the direction that you ought to be focusing on are distractions. And this is why distractions are very dangerous. Distractions are what they are very, very dangerous because some people have made something that has distracted them to become their, their, their main goal. People are focused on distractions as their main priorities and leaving the key things of life. I said to someone, I said, for me, procrastination and laziness are pretty much the same thing. It's just a manifestation of, you know, of laziness. Procrastination is a manifestation of laziness. That's my conclusion. You can define it differently because. This, the reason I say that is because it is very difficult to find somebody who is doing nothing. Even by doing nothing, you are doing something. The issue is that you are busy doing the things you are not supposed to be doing. You are busy focusing your energy and attention on things that will not contribute to where God is taking you. You are focusing your energy and attention on things that will not contribute to where to the purpose that to, to help you fulfill the purpose and the plan of God for your life. The more you spend time on something, the more you become that thing. That's a very that's an abstraction, right? But the point is, you, you know, in my culture, in Yoruba language, you know, I think there's a saying about soap and leaf. Because when you're washing out in the, in the backyard, you put the soap back or you put it on the leaf. And they say when the, the soap stays so long on the, on the leaf, even the leaf itself becomes like soap. It becomes soapy. It becomes like you could almost use that leaf to wash something else. Does that make any sense to you? It means that the attributes of the soap or, or the soap rubs up, the bass rubs up on the, on, on the leaf that is holding it, on the, the, the soap case or whatever you want to call it in this part of the world, right? The key thing that you have to, you ought to understand is this, that the things that we spend our time on, the things that we focus on, is what we become, is what achieves for us. So you might say to me, I want to become a lawyer, but if you spend your time focused on watching TV, you're going to just end up becoming a TV watcher. <laughs> that must sound like a joke, but you get what I'm trying to say. Because you're not contributing towards the direction of where you're really going. Focused on what is in front of you. Have your mind set on the ultimate goal, but focus on what is in front of you. Because what is in front of you is the step that you need to take to get to where you're going. You, want, you, you know, we all know that eternity starts from here. John chapter 17 verse number 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We know that. 
But we know that we are saved by faith right now. We know that there's an ultimate goal ahead of us as believers. So we are heaven conscious. We're focused on heaven. The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So that's where our heart is. But we also say in the moment, we focus on the moment, and we pray in the moment. We don't say, oh, because we know that ultimately we're going we to be saved. Ultimately, we're going to put on the same body as the Lord Jesus. Ultimately, we're going to worship God in the beauty of holiness. So therefore, I can do whatever I like now. No, we don't think like that. We focus in the moment. We pray in the moment. We fast in the moment. We worship God in the moment. We study the word of God in the moment. Because those are the instructions. Those are the tools available to us to keep us on the track to where we're really going. I think you need to begin to do a personal assessment right now. I think that you need to be de- begin to do surgery within your own heart right now. And begin to separate between the things that are of value and the things that are not of value. I'm not saying that I don't have fun. I'm not saying don't enjoy the, the joy. You know something? Let me tell you something about journey of life. What, what I've discovered, I'm, I'm still very young, right? But I've discovered something and I thank God that I've, I've come to this point in my life where I think this way. Because it's really set me free. A lot of us are focused on where we're going. And that's really important. But you know, you cannot get to where you're going right now. You, you can't get there right in this moment. The real joy of life is not just in where you're going. It's in the process that you're getting. The journey itself is the enjoyment. Enjoy the journey. But if you don't focus in the moment, if you don't enjoy, if you don't, if you don't look at what is ahead of you, in the, in the, what is imminent, you will never be able to enjoy the journey. You will never be able to enjoy the journey. If you meet any, every good runner, long distance runners, if you meet any of them, yesterday I ran, I don't know, 11.5, 11.6 miles. Now, see, let me tell you something about running, long, you know, running for long. It's about running for you know, just a little bit. The secret about running fast is actually about running slowly. Every single person who runs really fast at competitions is because they've spent long hours running very slowly. Conversational pace running. That's what they do. They build it into their training. See, when you want to run very far, the mind looks at marathon as something very difficult. The mind looks at, there are people who do Ironman. There are people who do 100 miles, 125 miles run. Race, I've never done such things before. I don't understand how people do it. But what every single person that you meet who is a very experienced runner, they will tell you something, that the easiest way to run far is to, you know, just, you know, compartmentalize the run. Break them down into two, three miles. I'm going to run the first three miles, and then I'm going to run the next three miles, and then I'm going to run the next three miles. I'm going to run. You just, just, it works for the brain better that way compartmentalize it. Just keep, you know, oh, when I get to that pole, and then, the, the ne- then when I get to that pole, then I'm going to run from that pole to the next pole, and then to the next one. And just like that, before you know it, you've covered much distance. See, you, at the end, at the back of your mind, the tape is at the back of your mind. The finish line is at the back of your mind. But in this moment, you are concentrated on what you have in front of you, what is achievable. Impossible tasks are actually possible when we look at them as small bits of possible tasks. If you can break something into small bits of tasks, they are not impossible. So, God has called you to be a pastor. God has called you to be a preacher. God has called you to write a book. Why don't you write the first line first? Why don't you write the first page first? Why don't you write the first chapter first? Why don't you understand, take time to study about the theme first? Why don't you take just one step first and focus on that? And do it so beautifully well. You know what the Bible says in Jeremiah? I can't remember exactly where now. It just flashed to my mind now. I can't remember exactly where now. It says, if you, if, you, if, you, if, you run, if you run with men and you struggled, how are you going to run with horses and prevail? Because the journey, why? In the moment builds you up for the ultimate. When you focus on what's in front of you, when you serve and you labor based on what is in front of you and you become, you create a mastery of what is in front of you, it prepares you for the next level. Because every time you get into the next level, there are deeper challenges. I think I've said this before, many years ago, I said it here, that, you know, I don't know how the scientists come up with their formulas, but activation energy, yeah, EA, 
activation maximum. You know, it's, it, they said, you know, a particle will gyrate for a certain period of time to create, to create energy enough to be able to move to another level. It will lose some, uh, some oxygen or lose some ions or whatever it is. I can't remember everything now. You know, chemical engineering is long gone in my life. I've not done it for 20-something years. But I just remember that activation maximum, to achieve that maximum, that you need to, uh, an object needs to, to be able to translate. You know, this is radioactivity and things like that. Don't worry about the science of it. The key thing is this. That object will spin around for a while. It will move around. It will create energy. And then when that energy achieves a certain level, then it can get promoted to the next level. Many of us, we want to jump from where we are now and go to where we're supposed to be. But there's a journey to get there. The, there is a destination in God. There is a purpose in God. And it will be fulfilled. But how long it will take you is how much you are ready to serve in the moment. How much you're ready to submit in the moment. How much you're ready to, to, to push away distractions. I start struggling when I'm running. I start feeling the pain in my body. I start feeling all the things that are going on when I'm distracted. But if I focus 20 meters ahead, just keep my focus, keep my gaze. If I'm, sometimes I'm running, I'm just praying, or I'm just singing, I'm worshiping, or I'm preparing a sermon. If I continue to do that, sometimes I'll just get like, oh, wow, I'm in front of my estate. Like, oh, we got back home. Because my mind was somewhere else all the while. Yet I was still moving. Yet I was still running. Distractions will keep you away from your destiny and your purpose if you give them the power to. What distractions are you giving power to in your life right now? Things that don't contribute to where God is taking you. Things that don't contribute to the plan and purposes of God in your life are distractions. This morning I was reading the story of Gideon in my Bible. I was reading about the story of Gideon, Gideon 7. And it says, Gideon, after, you know, in, in chapter 6, he had all kinds of encounter with God. And then in chapter 7, God had told him, go and lead this, so take over and lead this army against the Midianites. They've conquered your nation for seven years. They've ruled you and all of that. And God began to say to Gideon, these 220,000 soldiers, what are you going to do with them? They are too much for you, for what I want to do. You know, that was this big battalion. It's just uh, this massive army. It's just too huge. They've become a distraction to my power, to my purpose, to my plan. Gideon haven't experienced God in the small place of the wine press. Haven't experienced God with the small things, the, the small, you know, the, the little miracles, the minor miracles that God did for him. Because, you know, the, I mean, we know God made heaven and earth. That, those things are minor before God. You know, says, oh, put this here. Will it rain? Oh, no. Will this guy wear? Oh, all those kind of things. You know, God was just helping him to build his faith. But those experiences for him helped him to deal with the situation when he got to the war front. Because he knows that God means business. He knows that God is the one who has called him. He knows that God has a purpose and a plan for his nation. And he's going to bring it to pass. Through this youngest man in the smallest tribe, in the smallest Benjamin of the small nation Judah. God said to him, those who lap the water, who do this, separate them again. At the end of the day, only a handful of people were left. He didn't let fear distract him. Do you know that fear can become distraction? See, when fear comes to you, you're supposed to use it as a way to depend on God, not a way to find alternatives. When fear comes to you, you ought to convert and use it as a tool that pushes you back deeper into the place of prayer. Not something that becomes a distraction to where you're going. You can still do it afraid. Are you listening to me this morning? You can still do it scared. You can still press on despite the fear. That's what courage is. Courage is not the absence of fear. It is the ability to press further in the face of worry and fear and anxiety. The ability to keep going even when it looks like you shouldn't keep going. Nehemiah chapter 6. I'm sure you've been waiting for that. Who talks about focus without talking about Nehemiah? Nehemiah chapter 6. Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem. This is, these are three names I could never name my children. These guys are bad people. Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab. And the rest of our enemies 
found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors in the gates. I'm going to stop there for a moment and tell you something profound. Please listen carefully. Distractions don't often come when you have done nothing, when you have achieved nothing. Actually, the, real, the, the biggest distractions in our lives come when we've achieved something. When we feel like we've, you know, we've, we've made some progress. When we feel like, yeah, we've, made, we've moved a bit. There's some progress here. That's when you get, we get careless and we get distracted. Now I'm in the UK. So? Now we are married. Some people treat marriage as the ultimate. Like, so I'm married now, yeah. So we just throw everything down and that's it, we're married. Every progress you make is the beginning of a new journey. Every progress you make is the beginning of a new journey. Every progress you make is the beginning of a new journey. Number two, verse number two, Nehemiah 6. So Sambalat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I cannot come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the message, the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Sambalat's servant came with an open letter in his hand. And, in this, and this is what it said. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me it is true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that, and that is why you are building the world. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get, get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us. Imagine, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. The response to distraction is to continue with a greater determination. The response to distraction to your purpose, the response to distraction to your destiny... Keep your eyes on the goal. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep focusing. Focus on where God is taking you and do the things that will help you to get there. Distractions will come along the way. When they come like that, and you, you, the way you prove that you have overcome them is to double your efforts. You know, we have in society today so much content to watch. So much videos available to us. So much information available to us. And this information, nine out of ten times, have become so much distractions. There was a period where I noticed that I couldn't concentrate when I was praying. If I'm praying, I just can't concentrate. I just, within five minutes, my mind is going to some, something else. My mind is just wandering all over the place. And it was happening, like, you know, two days, three days, one week. I think probably the second or third week or something like that. I was like, what's going on? So I made a conscious decision. That for a month, I wasn't going to watch anything. I, I don't even, no, I don't, no, I don't care. Don't worry. I, oh, something is breaking down. Oh, thank you. God bless you. It's okay. And I've said it here too before. That when you're fasting, you can stay off social media. That's a good way to fast these days. Stay off social media. Because there's just so much distractions in there. But how do you know that you've overcome that distraction? Double your effort. If you're trying to pray for 10 minutes before and you're being distracted, double to 20. 
Double your effort. Because you see, this human mind is part of this world. Why? Because it's learning from the world. The only way you can make that human mind listen to the spirit is to feed the spirit more than you feed the mind. So that the spirit can take control of the mind. Because the mind is a battlefield. The world, the, the flesh, the world and worldly systems fighting to take over your mind. And yet your spirit also is right there trying to take over. So what is going to take preeminence? It is what you feed that you reproduce, that you regurgitate. So when you t- spend all your time taking on all these things, let's not even go there now. Let's not even go to uh, things that we're taking in in our minds. When we're supposed to be focused on the work of God. When we're supposed to be focused on the things that bring us value. When we're supposed to bring, focus on things that bring us value and, 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 and material to where we're going in life. We are allowing these little, little foxes to mess up our vine. Even good things can become distractions. Because when you do them at the wrong time, they become distractions to you. So everybody's getting a relationship now. And God has said to you, consecrate yourself. This is not yet your time. Let them go. This is not yet your season. You just wait on me right now. I want to build you right now. That's what I want to do with you. I want to build you right now. Say, but everybody else is doing it. The Bible says don't follow majority to do what is wrong. Don't follow majority to do what is wrong. It says there are two pathways in life. It says there's a pathway that leads to eternal life. It says there's another pathway that leads to hell. It says but the pathway that leads to, eternal, to, to hell, it says it's so wide and it's so broad and it's huge. And there are so many people who go in that pathway. I remember giving you my recital from, from 12 years old. Many there be which go in their heart. King James Version. It says, for many there be, broad is the way that leads unto, 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 I can't remember that bit. It says, but many there be, I can't remember the King James Version of it anymore very well, but I remember that last part. Many there be which go in their heart. It says, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And only few people find it. Only pe- few people find it. Have you found life? If you have found it, are you focused on it? Paul says, I focus on the prize of the eye calling in Christ Jesus. I do not consider myself to have achieved anything. I do not consider myself to have attained anything special. Yes, I'm, 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 a, I'm a true Jew. I'm a Roman at the same time. I've healed the sick. Anchorship, handkerchiefs from my, from my aprons from my club was taken out to the sick and they got healed. I've preached to the, I carry the special grace of preaching to the Gentiles, the grace of God. I am an apostle of the most high God, ordained by God. I've planted churches all across Asia. I've planted churches all across everywhere. Everywhere, you know, everywhere I go, the word of God goes with me, confirming it with signs and wonders following. But I consider all these things to be nothing for the excellency of the heavenward call of God in Christ Jesus. I consider all these things to be immaterial. I consider them to have no eternal value because of the glory that Christ has called me to. So what I do is I put aside those successes. I put aside those, those victories. I put aside those accolades and those trophies and I focus to press on towards the heavenward call of God. I focus to, on that purpose because ultimately that's where I'm going. Ultimately that's my assignment. See, the thing with distractions is they offer us initial pleasure. Momentary pleasure. And a lot of people, we're living in days now where we're questioning why we have to discipline ourselves. In fact, the word discipline is almost like an abhorrent word now. We're living in days where if you feel like it, just do it. If you feel like walking with your head on the floor, go ahead. But can I say to you, for those of you whose focus is to inherit eternal life, you cannot live in the same way. If your focus is to achieve the ultimate goal that God has set before you, maybe your calling, maybe your assignment, maybe the career career of your choice, maybe your goal is to be in a decent relationship, maybe your goal 
is, 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 to, is, to, is, to, is to lead in certain sectors of society. You cannot afford to live like other people. Whilst it may be convenient for other people, it's not convenient for you. Whilst it's, it's pleasurable in the moment, it would rob you of your strength to continue moving. You know, remember the story about the sad we said last week. The problem is that every time you miss your way or every time you, you get distracted and you miss your turning, say, oh, I was on the phone. And so you miss the turning, you went on the next turning. What happens is the sad nav recalculates. God is gracious, right? God is merciful. The sad nav will recalculate. Your life will recalibrate. The problem, though, is that he adds what? He says five more minutes to the journey. And then you, 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 instead of you to stop that phone conversation so that you can't concentrate, God help you if you don't get into an accident. But as you're going along the way, you miss the turning again. It says turn left, you miss it again. And so he does what? He recalculates again. He adds another 10 minutes to the journey. If you're not careful, by the time you get to the destination, the party is already over. You might help them to clean up. So it's not God who is causing you to fail. Actually, it's not the car that is making you to fail. Actually, it's not the phone call that is making you fail. It's you because you're the one who picked the phone call. So nothing in this world can take you away from what God has in plan for you, except you. Except you. The Bible says focus on good things. Focus on righteousness. Focus on things of value. That will contribute to where you're going. He said, is there anything that is praiseworthy? Is there anything nice? Is there anything beautiful? He said, focus on those things. Don't be distracted in your thoughts. Don't be distracted in your life. Don't focus on things that will destroy your, your spiritual life. Just as a matter of personal choice, I just don't watch horror movies. You know, I just can't handle them. I just, I don't have the ability to handle them. Because I'll tell you why I don't watch it. I'm not actually afraid. I'm going to end here. You know, I'm just going to give you something practical and I'm going to stop here. My problem is not I can watch anything. That's not the problem. I'm not afraid of anything. I don't get scared or whatever. No, that's not the reason. The reason I don't watch all these things is because I want to be able to be confident of revel when God gives me revelation. That's the main reason. You probably don't understand what I'm saying. Do you understand what I'm saying? No. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not so clearly. Our minds play a lot of tricks on us. When you sleep and you have a dream, how do you know if God spoke to you? If, if it wasn't the movie you watched last night? I know you understand what I'm saying. How do you know it wasn't the movie you watched last night? How do you know it wasn't the devil just oppressing you and bullying you in your dreams? I want to always be in a place where I can differentiate between the three straight away. When God speaks to me, do you know how dangerous it is for you to be a pastor, for people to depend on you for spiritual matters? And I come to you and I say, God says, go this way. And I'm lying to you. Or I'm telling you the wrong thing. Many lives have been destroyed by people we call men of God who actually aren't men of God. Who did not hear anything from God. Case in point, the old prophet. You've got to be very careful with your Christian life. I'm not telling you what to do. You choose what you want to do, but this is what I've chosen. There are certain videos I'm not going to watch. There are certain movies I am not going to watch. There are certain things I'm not going to do in my life because it, it, it messes up my spiritual tentacles. It distracts me from hearing God clearly. I want to be in a place. I don't want to ever preach to somebody and tell you what I feel like. I don't want to ever have to cancel somebody and tell you what I feel like. I want to be able to do it from the place of prayer. I want to be able to do it from the place of the Spirit. And the only way, I, at least the only physical things I can do other than praying and making sure I'm fasting, I'm in the Word of God, is to discipline myself and cut off some things. It's part of my consecration. It's consecration. I'm not saying, oh, you're a sinner for watching certain things. Oh, no, I'm not, it's not my job to judge you. I know you're judging yourself already. That's enough. Let, let, let's stop there today. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give a clap unto Jesus. Give a clap unto Jesus.